in my prior work before Dr. Phil, when I had like a real job, one of the things I did was work on airline crashes, many, many of them. One of the things I had to do was assess pilot performance in the cockpit. So I listened to the cockpit voice recorders, which are the last 30 minutes of the flight, right down to impact. I have two boys, and they would be really interested because it would be all over the news and everything. And then I would fly to the site and come home with a copy of this cockpit voice recorder and hearing the pilots the last 30 minutes down to impact. And they were always saying, oh, that's so cool. Can we hear it? Not one time in all those years did I let one of my boys hear one second of those recordings because there's just some things you're just not supposed to hear. You just, you can't unhear it once you hear it. Yeah. We're just not geared for that. And I look at Molly hearing 138 videos of suicide and self-harm. There's some stuff we're not supposed to hear, let alone be overwhelmed with it. The coroner's conclusions were that to Molly, who had, who had depressive tendencies, that what the videos had done, and it was the sheer volume of the videos, that she'd gotten them repeatedly again and again and again, it had normalized the idea in her head that the normal way out of feeling that way was to kill yourself. So she took her own life because she thought that was the right, that was the normal was way the out step. of those feelings. Yeah. And if you've built a system that does that to kids, A, you know, the, if, you, if, you, if it was a product on the market, you'd, you'd immediately run into the factory floor and say, stop, stop. It's, it, we've, got, we've, got to, we've got to work out what's going wrong. These platforms yeah. double down. You said it earlier, you would do a recall. Right. If you had a car that ended with that outcome, you would do a recall, and they're doing the opposite. When you see the algorithms in action, when, like we did, when we saw how the algorithm so rapidly started giving people this content, when we study Instagram and other platforms in YouTube, here's the crazy thing. There's a lot of conversation right now about saying, let's ban TikTok then because it has the most addictive algorithm. It does. It's the most effective of the algorithms. The other platforms are really happy about that. So they're all secretly saying, yeah, ban TikTok. Do you want to know why? Because Instagram is trying to copy it right now with Instagram Reels. So TikTok, which is a Chinese company, has cracked the formula for the crack cocaine of algorithms. It is the most addictive, the most dangerous algorithm ever. The problem is that Meta, which owns Instagram, and Google, which owns YouTube, are doing exactly the same thing with Instagram Reels and YouTube Shorts now. So they are playing a really, really sly game. They are saying, yeah, ban TikTok. Meanwhile, they're trying to develop the same technology themselves. It's kind of time that we just deal with the industry as a whole, because the truth is that all of them are kind of as bad as each other these days. Yeah, I see it when we're preparing for this kind of conversation and show. You see it, and they're really starting to get pretty close, pretty oh, similar. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I, I think TikTok is slightly, it, it has the advantage. It's a really clean, uh, it's going to sound dumb, but it's about how easy the user is to create content and to distribute it. And actually these are often the things that are marginal between a great product and a good product. Um, and TikTok's got it right, but Meta is a big company. I mean, Mark Zuckerberg has made himself worth $100 billion. You do that by being a pretty smart guy at running a business. And I think that they will eventually crack it. Google is one of the world's biggest businesses. And I think it's really important that we remember that, that the, the race they are in is not a race for who can create the best content or the best experience. It is who can create the most addictive experience. And addiction, it's a word that we, you know, we in society think of as a, that's a, one of the negative words. Addiction is a bad, I, bad thing. Social media is literally a platform whose job it is to addict you for as long as possible. And in doing so, addiction often has a lot of negative, you know, ne negative consequences to it, including killing young people. I've always said that young people have the knowledge, but not the wisdom to use the internet, it's our job with fully developed brains to bring the wisdom to see around corners. But to do that, we have to acknowledge that this artificial intelligence is taking over and happening. 
and it's feeding all of this to the kids. We may not have the knowledge of how they navigate around all this quickly, but we do need to have these conversations. This program that you and Ian have put together, you know, parents don't know where to start. They don't know how to start. And I love the fact that one of your steps in there is the approach of you teach me, show me how this is working, show me what it's doing. I have found that when these kids learn, they want to be so independent and so self-determined. When they learned, you're getting played, (laughs) then they don't like that. And sometimes they'll push back. But this getting them to teach the parent is a brilliant approach. It's just a brilliant turn of phrase in getting them to be open to teach their parents about this. And it opens the dialogue. Well, you know, I I kind of realized this for my staff because they take real joy. They're all 20 years younger than me. They take real joy in explaining to Grandpa Imran how TikTok (laughs) works. And they're like, hey, come on, we'll show you, Grandpa. And I I sort of, I explain so that that what, I think there's a really nice dynamic to it. And it feels really, um, it feels really symmetrical for the kids to be able to do something for their parents and for the parents to be able to give something back. Yeah. And I think that's a wonderful way that we can actually bridge gaps between in in knowledge and the knowledge of how the platforms work for the parents, but the knowledge of what that content means for the kids. What is normal? You know, how can I contextualize these feelings that I have, these emotions I'm encouraged to have in terms of how I should think about myself, think about my place in society and think about how I live my life? Yeah. When you said it seemed like the normal thing, that's how you get out of these feelings. That just sent chills down my spine. That seemed to her like this is what people do when they get to this point. That's really disturbing that they're programming her for that. It was. And I, 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 I saw Ian when I was last in London, we had, um, we had breakfast together, a coffee together. And, um, I'm, I'm like, Ian is really British and kind of, you know, stoic and, and he's just been through so much and he's been so dignified and so decent throughout it all. And I'm not as stoic. And so I just desperately want to give him a hug and, 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 and share his, share his pain because he, what he has been through is unimaginable. And I know that the reason he does what he does today tells his story and tells Molly's stories because he desperately wants this not to happen to any more parents. He desperately wants this to happen. I think for Ian and for Molly, we need to make sure that we, you know, we say like one is too many. The, the thousands of children who have been affected by this, the tens of thousands, possibly a lot, lot more because we haven't done enough studies on this. We need to do this for them now. 